What up, Bebop? I'm Leon, the Paperback Maniac, coming at you with another Vintage Horror Book Review. Today, we are taking a look at The Jim Jams by Michael Green. This book was published by Pocket in 1994. Yes, we're taking another trip back to the 90s, which explains the Zima shirt I'm currently wearing. Uh, now, first of all, just take a moment to soak in that amazing cover art, courtesy of Jim Warren. Uh, it, it is a cover every bit as amazing as the title of this novel, uh, and lest you think that the book itself couldn't possibly live up to the ludicrousness of that cover, you would be mistaken. Uh, I am happy to report that this book more than lives up to its amazing cover and title. Uh, so, yes, uh, I will go ahead now and read the synopsis from the back cover. Blue Turtle Island is crawling with things to do if the Jim Jams don't do you in first. Duffy Ferris and his wife Rose have dream jobs managing the exotic Blue Turtle Island resort. Duffy is a man dedicated to extremes of leisure and pleasure. Fortunately, his work allows him to mix paradise, rounds of golf, and his quest for the ultimate high. But he's not hallucinating when he stumbles upon his first Jim Jam, a wide-eyed, inquisitive little creature that throws him way off par. And he's pretty straight when he finds its home, a pulsing, yawning orb that Duffy can't resist, and that threatens to transform Blue Turtle Island into a satanic sandbox. Even as the boat unloads another weekend's worth of mild-mannered retirees, the Jim Jams are scurrying to work, biting, sucking, and planting their seeds of insane, burning desire. It will require all the arthritic strength of guests like Earl Duchette and his wife Anna to outrun the swarm, to escape a fate far worse than growing old. And in addition to the Jim Jams, they must battle the increasing ranks of their human minions, whose hunger and desire won't be satisfied by paradise alone. Wow, uh, even the synopsis is uh, fairly well written. Uh, that is uh, pretty rare. I'll leave it to Pocket to have a well written synopsis. Uh, but yes, okay, so this uh, novel opens with Duffy Ferris, uh, a manager of the exotic Blue Island, uh, Blue Turtle Island Resort, uh, just off the coast of Tampa, uh, trying to squeeze in a few rounds of golf. Uh, on the putting green uh, to relax, uh, you know, before the uh, the weekend batch of old timers arrive. So he's out there, you know, kind of just loving life, looking out over the co uh, the the uh, the golf. When he spots uh, a weird looking bug on the putting green, uh, a bug that is quoted as looking like a cross between a spider and a bony red frog with wings, and it's actually uh, that thing that you see uh, right there on the cover. And uh, so, you know, revolted, uh, seeing as he hates bugs, especially ugly-looking bugs like this, uh, Duffy draws back his golf club and uh, lets her rip, just whacking the shit out of this this weird little thing, and basically, like, making it explode into, like, a million pieces that fly every which way. And, um, you know, he notices that there are some, um, you know, chunks of the thing's tissue uh, adhering to the uh, tip of his golf club. So, uh, you know, first of all, like to kind of wind down, he, he removes a vial of cocaine from his pocket uh, and a little like short bamboo straw, takes a little bump to get the edge off, and then uh, kind of smears the uh, the tip of his uh, golf club on the grass and then goes over to a nearby pond and kind of dips it in uh, to, to clean it off. And as he's doing this, he notices a, a goldfish kind of uh, scurry over, skim over the surface of the uh, the pond uh, that looks like it's trailing uh, like a fresh wound, like there's like blood and like tissue hanging out its side, uh, and he thinks that's weird. And that that would be because uh, the goldfish had uh, just previously tried to take a bite out of the uh, severed head of the little creature that landed in the pond and had a, you know a nice chunk of its uh, side ripped out. Uh, and then later when it tries to go back, uh, you know, to attack the, the head again, which is described as being uh, about the size of an acorn and like having its thorax all ripped out, uh, the thing uh, bites out the uh, goldfish's eyeball. So right away you're like, what the hell is going on here? at uh, Blue Turtle Island Resort, right? Um, we then meet uh, Duffy's wife, Rose, uh, who's cleaning and preparing cabins, you know, getting ready for the 26 new uh, weekend vacationers who are set to arrive by noon uh, this day. 
and uh, and also kind of worrying about their their new puppy Crow, who has been missing for the last twelve hours, uh, ever since you know kind of chasing a seagull down the beach. And so when she sees her husband Duffy, she asks him if he's seen uh, Crow, their puppy, and he says no, you know, no sight, no sight of him or her. And then uh, she asks him if he'll you know like take another look while she kind of finishes finishes up pre- prepping the cabins. And, uh, you know, like, this is kind of like the last thing Duffy wants to do. Duffy just wants to relax, you know. He'd rather, you know, crack open a beer, maybe go go inside, make himself a sandwich, nosh on some Doritos. But, you know, to humor his wife, he says, okay, you know what, I'll go take another look. He decides, you know, maybe he'll um, head on down the trail to Coral Beach, just like 30 minutes max, look for this thing. He figures that the, the, the puppy is long gone. So, um, you know, he takes another bump of cocaine, like through his bamboo uh, straw, you know, for uh, fortification, and then uh, wanders down uh, the trail, and he and he goes into this uh, tree-shaded forest uh, off the trail, and as he's in there, he starts to hear this uh, weird, like, whistling, snapping, chirping sound, uh, you know, coming from within a thicket of uh, bamboo. And uh, so he wanders down there, uh, and as he's approaching, he also hears uh, kind of like a, the, the, a moaning sound, almost like of an animal in pain. And he thinks, oh shit, is this the dog? And he, he wanders into a clearing uh, where he sees what appears to be this kind of round, high-tech looking tent like out in the in the clearing of these of this these woods. And at first this pisses him off because he's thinking like this is supposed to be a this is a private island. What's this person doing here? But as he gets closer, he notices that it's not actually a tent because it's completely uh the surface is flawless. There are no zippers or flaps anywhere. It's this like ugly puke green color. And uh as he approaches it, he sees um that you know it has like these crazy geometrical designs etched onto the surface of it. And then at the base of the orb, he finds uh, a severed dog's tail um, twitching on on the grass. His dog's tail, crow's tail. And he goes over and picks it up, and it feels heavier uh, than it should be. And then uh, suddenly, this... uh, it starts like the tail starts like twitching and like wriggling back and forth, and then this slimy white worm like kind of like comes out of like the the bloody end uh, of the tail, and it kind of like like looks at him, uh, and its mouth sort of like starts to wriggle and look like it's almost about to start speaking to him, and uh, you know. A ducky, a Duffy is repulsed by this. Obviously, he heaves, uh, throws the, the the tail out into the the, the trees, and um, then he starts to hear like this the, these sounds coming again, like these weird like uh, these weird like chirping sounds. And so he starts to like circle around the base of this dome, and uh, on the other side of it, he is horrified uh, to see his dog uh, Crow. Uh, just the head mounted on like the face of the dome, mounted like some sort of quote macabre hunting trophy, and still alive. The dog is like looking at him with pleading, uh, bloodshot eyes, uh, panting with its tongue out and wagging like it's like waiting for a biscuit or something, and um, it looks like it's organically attached to the top of this this sphere, uh, although there's like no like opening in its throat. And, and, and so Duffy's like, how the hell is it even still alive? And where the fuck is this body, right? And um, so, you know, he, he can't just take it anymore. He's like seeing the, like, the mournful look in, in the, the dog's eyes. So he goes up to the, to the head and, you know, places his hands around its ears and tries to like, like pull it off, remove it. And um, nothing happens at first. Actually, the dog starts like licking his arm and like leaving like a like trail of bloody saliva along his forearm. And uh, and then I, I'll actually let Michael Green take it from here because this is just like a really uh, really great little little passage as he's trying to remove his dog's head from this uh, sphere. It says, um, "Crow slipped free with a slick slurp, sliding from the dome like it was made of jello." Stumbling backward, Duffy lost his footing and fell into the ferns. The dog ended up in his lap. What was left of her did, anyway. Her legs were gone, and so was most of her skin. Bands of delicate pink-white muscle rippled and quivered, and Duffy could see the blood pulsing through the fine blue veins. He watched until it finally stopped, until Crow shuddered and died. Then Duffy slowly turned his head away and vomited, his loud racking heaves the only sound in the whole damn world. So, uh, yeah, then 
as the, after this has happens, he hears a, again the same like loud like clicking and bleeping and uh, you know whistling sounds as he did earlier. And then he looks up and sees you know where uh, his dog's head had been. Now there's this basketball sized hole on the top of the dome, and out of its surface he sees um, a couple more of these like red uh, spider like uh, toad like things. Uh, emerge from the from the tip of the hole. The same thing that he saw on the putting green. He sees one and then he sees another and they kind of unfurl these uh, iridescent wings. Uh, one of them lands kind of at the grass on his feet and then like a few more emerge from the hole and before you know it these things are kind of just like pouring out of this dome and sort of like attacking him, going at him, like stinging him all over. And, uh, you know, Duffy is, uh, is shocked and scared. He like throws the, his dog's corpse at them to try to like get them away. And uh, they're going all over him. And then he notices that this, uh, this sphere is packed full of these things. It's almost like a hive, just buzzing and just emptying these things. We get these spide- spidery red toads just uh, crawling all over his body. Um, and as this is all happening, suddenly uh, Duffy begins to feel uh, incredibly calm. And he starts to see this as being a beautiful moment. And he starts to see these, you know, spidery red creatures as uh, almost like angels coming to him. Even as they are, uh, a couple of them start having sex uh, on the grass in front of him. Um, A couple of them, yeah. They start screwing each other with uh, penises as thick as Q-tips and, quote, uh, working themselves into a frenzy with precisely timed thrusts. Their little round acorn faces gone slack with lust. So, um... Yeah, and then Duffy soon even feels himself starting to get aroused as he feels a couple of these things uh, rubbing against him in his pants. Uh, You know, these creatures, which he uh, refers to as Freddy's, uh, named after his brother. So the the creatures are actually, they're actually uh, called Freddy's, not the Jim Jams, despite what the uh, the back cover says. The Jim Jams actually is apparently is like like an expression, sort of like uh, the Willies or the Heebie Jeebies, uh, although I've never heard heard that. Maybe it's like an old, like 90s thing, but... um, but yeah, these these things, uh, as as a uh, you know, Duffy is just being inundated with them, and they're crawling all over him and getting inside him. He starts to feel like this is amazing. He thinks, oh, "Isn't life great? Isn't everything just peachy?" Uh, and he realizes now that this is his destiny. Uh, he is now the quote unquote seed bearer or the burning one. And, you know, he suddenly realizes, uh, you know, if my wife and everyone on this island has to die, so be it, right? Because this is destiny. And um, so, you know, he gets up, he retrieves his uh, fallen Lakers cap, and uh, he just nonchalantly steps over the remains of his dog, which, quote unquote, uh, resemble a large chunky mound of cranberries and noodles. (laughs) That's just uh, lovely. And, um... You know, he goes and then, you know, the dome has now transformed into like this uh, completely transparent uh, crystal bubble uh, that looks look like that's like kind of half embedded in the ground. And, um, you know, Freddy, these Freddy's creatures are like resting on his shoulders and his head and all over his body. And he walks up to this crystal dome and he touches, uh, you know, the mirror smooth surface of it uh, with his hand. And he feels a sort of a warm uh, breathing current coursing through his uh, his fingers. Yeah, and then he passes out. Uh, so it's, you know, it's all too, it's a lot for a man to take, right? And uh, when he comes to, uh, the dome is no longer transparent. It's returned back to its original kind of uh, puke green color. And um, what he sees at its base is uh, a pale blue cocoon. Uh, it's about the size of a duffel bag. And so he picks it up, and he puts it to his ear, and he hears a uh, sound of like bone grinding against bone. And then he bears it aloft like it's a lover and uh, starts uh, walking back uh, to the resort uh, with you know, the Freddies uh, perched on his shoulders, uh, singing the song of angels uh, to his ears, right? And so when he gets back to the resort, resort uh, he sees his wife, actually, uh, Anna, swimming in the pool, and uh, she notices right away that something is off about her husband, something about like the way he's walking. He's got this weird, like stiff-legged gait, and he has this odd grin on his face. And then he tells his wife, 
uh, he tells her to come back into the cabin. He's got something to show her. So she's thinking, well, you know, did he find the dog maybe? But, you know, if that's the case, why is he making that idiotic grin? She's a little unnerved. But she follows her husband uh, into the cabin um, and, you know, and, and, and uh, Duffy is like, oh, don't worry, baby. He's like, everything is just peachy. Everything is great. And uh, when she goes inside, she sees something lying on the mattress of the bed. And at first, she thinks, like, could this be the dog, like her dog? But then uh, she gets a closer look and notices that it is um, this weird bundle. It actually kind of looks like a, a cotton candy cocoon, she says. Um, and then when she turns to face her husband to, like, ask him, like, what the hell he brought into the cabin, uh, he, uh, Duffy has this hideous leer on his face, this, this terrible grin, and he says... Uh, hey, Rose, want to formicate? Uh, not fornicate, but formicate. It was a little pun. Uh, formication uh, is uh, basically the sensation of like bugs crawling all over your body. So, so a little like cheesy 90s pun there. Um, and then uh, Duffy drops his shorts and Rose looks and is horrified to see like a half dozen of these red uh, critters like hanging from his ball sack. And, uh, and then he uh, whispers to her, uh, I am the burning man. And then he, uh, uh, basically like a dozen or more, like dozens of, of these red critters start like emptying out of his mouth and, and he approaches her and spreads her legs and, uh, and rapes her so that the festivities may begin. Uh, oh my, yes. Uh, yeah, it does look like it's going to be one hell of a weekend for the vacationers who are looking for a little, uh, you know, weekend of sunshine and, and paradise at the Blue Turtle Island Resort. Uh, it's going to be a tough time, especially for uh, a guy named Earl Duchette and his wife, Anna, who are, you know, coming for the weekend to get some much needed R&R &R after, you know, Anna has recently gone into remission after having like a tumor removed. Um, so, yeah, I mean, things seem out of whack right from the start as the uh, the boat is arriving uh, onto the island. And, um, you know, the passengers are looking and they stare in shock at the coast as they see Duffy and and his wife, Rose, uh, on the uh, naked on the sand, screwing like rabbits with their faces like squinched up in, in pleasure, and then scurrying off into the trees when uh, like the boat sounds its horn. Um, and... Uh, yeah, it only gets weirder from there uh, because Duffy, uh, now his body and brain are totally infested with all these little Freddies uh, and he has become the uh, burning man or, quote, he who bore the seed. And his wife, now herself infested, is uh, referred to as the little mother or she who nurtured it. And, um, yeah, we also get later on the queen mother, uh, who was ultimately birthed, uh, also a Mr. Magoo looking, uh, Boglin type creature, which is right here on, on the cover. And, um, and is actually referred to as Magoo because it looks like Mr. Magoo. And, uh, before long, you know, the people on the island are being infested as well with these, uh, you know, red parasitic bugs uh, and just, you know, some of them are the size of beach balls. Some of them are as minute as grains of sand, but they're, they're going along and, you know, before you know it, uh, there are just uh, bug infested and betumored humanoids running around many some of whom are bad people to begin with uh, and many of whom have uh, pressing carnal desires i may add and just uh causing complete mayhem and all of this is at the service of the hide hideously mutated duffy uh and rose who have you know themselves been lost to the will of this malign uh, alien presence on the island so um yeah, that that is your 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 setup for this book. Um, yeah, this thing, this this novel felt like a like a love letter written to me personally. It was almost like someone said, like, what is everything that uh, Leon the paperback maniac likes? Let me put that into into a book. Uh, I mean, first off, I love creature features. I have always loved them, and you know, to discover such a fun uh, creature horror novel. From the from the early to mid '90s, and and totally embodying that aesthetic uh, is just such a treat. Uh, I mean, this book is like perfectly paced. It starts off 
like right away, like right from the very beginning when Duffy's on the putting green and he sees that, that uh, Freddie uh, and it just does not let up. Um, it's also really well written. It's got some nice vivid uh, turns of phrase. Uh, I've said this before. Uh, Pocket is definitely the publisher that had the best writing. Um, they like, yeah, even the synopsis that I read, I thought was much better written than most, most synopses. But um, yeah, it was really well, well written. We get some really cool uh, gross out body horror stuff. Um, you know, like mutating people, sprouting uh, like tumors and polyps and, you know, fruity uh, clusters of growths, uh, you know, with fleshy sacks hanging from their skin, uh, you know, things like sea anemones. And uh, it's just it's some of the best body horror I've read in a novel in a, in a while. Um, Actually, I, I have a little quote here I'm going to read uh, that's sort of detailing uh, the bodily changes that Duffy is experiencing uh, in his transition to being the, the Burning Man. Uh, let me see if I can uh, find this. A man of destiny, he thought, gazing down at the new and improved Duffy. All kinds of neat doodads were sprouting on him now. A band of strange red growths as slick as eyeballs encircled his waist. A knobby belt of bulbs and bubbling aneurysms that just wouldn't quit oozing a yolky, runny pus. His fingernails and toenails were black and long, and his knees were so swollen they looked about ready to burst. Thin pink stripes of what appeared to be scar tissue crisscrossed his chest, belly, and thighs. Pallid and puffy, his arms were flecked with greenish phosphorescent patches. Scores of small lumps the size of pinheads moved back and forth underneath his skin, racing up and down like there was no tomorrow. Beneath each breast, a baseball-sized mass of shiny fat and pale chitinous gristle had pushed through his flesh, two quivering spheres that liked to tick as quietly as muffled clocks. Hey there, sport, he thought, running his hands down the length of his body, feeling himself grow hard again, the tiny white tendrils surrounding the base of his penis twitching with a life of their own. Hot enough for you? It's just, uh, I mean, that, that is just so choice. I, I, I love, I love that. Um, yeah, and, and by the way, Duffy, you know, just keeps mutating over the course of the novel uh, till, uh, you know, by the end, he he has essentially become a walking, talking garbage pill kid sticker. It's just, it's just lovely. Um, we also get some awesome uh, creature descriptions, uh, such as the, uh, the the mother at the end who is birthed, uh, or, or who is also known as the uh, quote newborn queen of all our dreams. Um, you know, she comes out of the cocoon. Uh, also, you know, like all all the Freddies and and Magoo and and Magoo. I, I mentioned Boglins earlier. I don't know. Do do any of you guys remember Boglins? It was a cool. Uh, uh, horror toy uh, in the 80s for kids. The, the 80s had all the cool monster toys like Boglins and Mad Balls and My Pet Monster. What do you know? I actually have a couple here. Um, here's a Boglin. I, I just kept thinking of this guy. Um, yeah, that. Uh, or uh, I got another one. Here's Flurp. These, uh, well, the glare is pretty bad, but you kind of you kind of see. Uh, there are all the Boglins, just like classic 80s sort of uh, little critters. But yeah, I just kept thinking of that as I was reading like some of these some of these creatures, especially the the Magoo one. But um yeah, the, the, this novel is also incredibly funny at times. Um I, I laughed aloud multiple times, which which does not happen uh, frequently. But um, uh, like, I particularly love the internal monologue of uh, one character named Spencer who works uh, for the resort, and his job is to like, um, you know, uh, drive the boat uh, for all, like, to bring all the the newcomers, uh, these old like retired like people, uh, to the island, and and he just hates them so much, and he's always just like talking shit about these old geezers like in his mind, and and it just totally rang true. Like, I could totally see a guy just like being like completely like out of like just sick of it his job and just hating like the like these old people that he has to deal with all the time in fact uh i did note a, a quote here uh this is spencer um describing kind of like sometimes like the old timers like to to like come into the cabin and watch him as he's uh kind of like pulling into the island and i thought this was really funny um where is this um in every group so far, at least one geezer turned up to watch Spencer pull the boat in, to share in the excitement of the daring maneuver. 
the thrill of a lifetime. It was like maybe they were landing on the moon or something, or bringing a 747 into Miami International with only one engine. Last Friday, there'd been a whole committee of them up here, giving him pointers, talking him through it, guiding him in. He'd felt like Captain Kirk on the bridge of the Enterprise, surrounded by his faithful crew. <laughs> I just thought that's such a, a funny like way of just being so like uh, you know cavalier about your job and just being so belittling these these old timers. Um, yeah, but uh, you know, yeah, it's also got a, a, a great kind of sunny island setting. Uh, the, the resort itself is, is described well, and uh, you know, reading the book in that sense, it's almost like going on vacation, right? But but uh, but an awesome vacation filled with uh, spidery, frog-like, winged uh, creatures. Uh, but you know, all to be enjoyed from the safety of your own sofa. So uh, yeah, just absolutely amazing. But uh, yeah, this book also had some pretty cool uh, characters that I enjoyed, you know, following. I thought the dialogue and repartee between uh, some of the couples was was really good. And you know, uh, it is definitely rare uh, to read a horror novel in which pretty much all of the, the the main characters are are elderly people, right? You do not, you definitely do not see that. I mean, our hero, I guess, would be Earl Duchette, one of these vacationers. He's like the youngest of, of the of the old timers, but he's no spring chicken himself, right? And um, you know, I mean, these aren't like college students running around or high school students as we are wont to get in in horror. And, um, you know, I've, I've said it before, uh, horror is definitely, you know, most effective when um, the, 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 the victims or the people in peril are, are vulnerable, right? And this is why, you know, historically horror has had, you know, uh, you know female or ch young children uh, being like the, uh, the victims or the people uh, pursued by the evil. And uh, this book definitely reminds us that uh, elderly people are pretty freaking vulnerable themselves, right? Absolutely. And the author will remind us of this fact constantly in the way that he is sort of likening uh, and like describing old people like, like, like their babies, right? With their, you know, thin skin and their thin downy hair, uh, you know, like their, their slowness and their feeble nature. Um, so, you know, that's, that's, that's great. I mean, it is a theme that is, I think, brilliantly summed up uh through this choice bit of dialogue uh, from one of the elderly, elderly vacationers who says, yeah, getting old can be kind of rough. Why, there was a time when I used to have four supple members and one stiff one. Now I've got four stiff ones and one supple one. <laughs> Yeah, it's just great. And, and speaking of which, uh, actually, uh, this is maybe the only novel that I can think of that, that has a, a fairly detailed scene of uh, elderly people having sex. And um, surprisingly, it's not as cringe-inducing as, as you may think. Uh, it's actually done pretty well, although there is one laugh-out-loud moment where the guy uh, injures his back in the process and has to kind of like slow, slow her down, uh, which is, is kind of funny. Proceed with caution. Right. Uh, but yeah, uh, you, you definitely do not see books populated almost entirely, entirely with elderly uh, people. It's a nice change of pace, you know, from like the usual like high school or young, younger people. Um, and I mean, come on, just like the idea of a bunch of wealthy, <laughs> retired old geezers just getting like hacked, uh, attacked and just uh, infested with red parasites. I mean, that's just awesome, right? It's just absolutely great. Uh, but yeah, I mean, what a, what an utter blast this was. It was super fun, super inventive. Uh, I mean, this is the kind of book that definitely has me smiling from ear to ear uh, the whole time I read it. Uh, if you are a creature fan, uh, especially if you like uh, like 90s uh, creature features, you know, if you like films like uh, The Boneyard or Ticks, or if you're a fan of like a comedy horror, you know, parasite uh, creature features like um, Night of the Creeps, or uh, James Gunn's Slither, or uh, the 80s version of The Blob, then this is definitely uh, the book for you. Um, God, yeah, what a gem. I, I can't believe that this book is, is so obscure. Uh, and and the, the tragedy is, is that this guy only wrote one other horror novel, to my knowledge. Uh, an, an amazing looking book with an equally awesome title called Dry Skull Dreams, uh, which I am super stoked to read now. But I mean, like, why wasn't this guy heralded as like the next best thing when this book came out in 1994? I don't understand. I mean, if there's a publisher watching this video, put this fucking thing back in print. Uh, th this book is great. And and, uh, and make a movie of this book because it, it just needs, there needs to be one. Uh, but yeah, I, I would say this book definitely joins the ranks with 
uh, John Shirley's In Darkness Waiting as one of the most entertaining and memorable uh, creature horror novels I have ever read. I, I absolutely loved it, and uh, it easily gets my highest recommendation. Uh, so, yes, that is The Jim Jams by Michael Green. Uh, check it out, yo, especially if you're into um, 90s aesthetic and, and sort of like weird critters and creature body horror type stuff. Uh, it, it, was, it was a treat. So, hope you guys enjoyed the review. Thanks for watching. As always, uh, check back soon for more fun uh, horror-related videos. I'll see you guys later. Peace out.